Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really my great pleasure to be here, and I'll we'll be talking about computer-based mass education in China. And starting with this, I'm from Tsinghua University. As of today, most universities in China do not allow their first-year student, college student, to use com personal computers at all. This is a rule. Okay, so that's how we're going to start computer-based mass education in China. So what do I do? Break all the rules. So hide computers from the administration. How do I do that? So for example, I tell them iPhone is not really a phone. It's really a you know, traditional di dial tone or whatever. And uh, I try to hide it in inside of my student's body. So I invited uh, Professor Cho. You know, he, he's an expert in uh, RFID, you know, things of that sort. But anyway, let's, let's stop the joke. The key point being that today, in this heavily computer and technology-driven society, administrations are so backward, it is unbelievable. However, to break this apart completely from the existing way how we get students to work, we want to give them a physical environment as well as a digital environment. I call them toy houses around all campuses around China or hopefully around the world to basically completely reinvent the way they interact with technologies. So I was, I mean, Tsinghua University. Every year, we have roughly 10 million people competing for 4,000 positions in my university. In my department, my, I, I take in 60 students every year. So roughly, they have to be the top 10 students in every million students to get into my class. So these people are really, really smart. So, so then, if I were to do computer-based mass education or any education, they're probably already too smart for me to teach them anything in the first place. So I did, decided to do something slightly different. I said, well, can you guys give me some people who are really, really stupid and see if we can use computer-based education to make them smarter? So, so they found me a great school called Nimbo Polytechnic. These are the people who are not even getting to the first 10 million whatever uh, slots. So the remaining 10 million people of the population every year, roughly China has about 20 million people getting into college year, college level school every year. So this is a student. So they are in my toy house. So, so I, I, I talked to some of the mathematicians. They said, well, how can you possibly teach these people advanced math, especially calculus? It's unteachable. So somebody was talking about that yesterday. So I found a French journalist. Okay, that's the person in the picture. He is running a social enterprise called makesense.org. So basically, I said, well, you can come to teach my, my students uh, math. He said, how, I don't even know calculus. How can I possibly do that? There's no problem. Well, just come, come, and we'll see how, how it works. So I asked him to run this social enterprise session to use brainstorm sessions to have students to think about what kind of thing you can use calculus for. So very quickly, they realized. One example proposed by this French uh, journalist was this uh, Nobel Prize winner, starting from the beginning with 27 US dollars. He loaned to some you know, poor woman in India. Soon they grow up to this uh, bank with 100 billion US dollars loan. So that's the notion of infinitesimally small and infinitesimally large in the real life. So things of these sorts are very, very interesting <coughs> ideas to first get people engaged with the content. So in, in this toy house kind of environment, I took away all the chairs. So it's basically just open space. And then I tried to create a new society for learning. So following lawyer's idea. So I used lawyer's idea to change you know, uh, engineering education, which is totally permissible in China because uh, they don't care about law in the first place. Um, <laughs> did I say that? OK. Um, so, so first of all, uh, this guy, who is also the creator for this thing called Creative Commons, the father of Creative Commons, he says that all societies are moved by four forces. The first one is technology or architecture. That happens before you even behave. This is infrastructure that constrains your behavior. Law are the things that punishes you after you've done something wrong or rewards you, rewards you with something after you did something good. So this is the front and back. Markets are the value judgment, money, that attracts you to do things. Norms are cultures that push you to do things even you don't want to. So it's push and pull. So before, after, push and pull, space and time and space basically covers all behavioral activities of humans. So when I came to Tsinghua, I realized to change all students' behavior at the same time will be almost impossible for anybody else, not for me. So that I said, well, why don't we do this? Instead of me teaching you the course, since you are so smart, why don't you teach me the course? So the parts in Chinese, the Debu area, all the time students are required to actually give me lectures during lecture hours 
every, every, every week I only have three, three, three hours with them. For them to actually give me the lecture, they have to prepare so much. So actually they spend, on average, every week, one STEMA student responds to doing that. They told me they have to spend 100 hours, each person, for 10, five to 10 people to pre pre prepare for this. On top of that, the uh, orange area are the things I randomly picked a team to report on their weekly progress. So they have to work literally every day, all day long. So they complained to me, they said, Ben, I'm taking eight courses. I'm spending 90% of all my waking hours working on your project. So I got very angry. I said, what happened to the remaining 10%? <laughs> well, you're supposed to integrate all your experience all together in, in this you know, college life. So in order to not only integrate their personal experience, I actually asked them to actually integrate all different projects across all different teams. So this is one of the things that they wrote this uh, uh, blog in actually talking about different templates. So all these different teams can use a template to basically com combine different projects. So every single project has a name. So I'll, I'll show you one of the projects later. Let's see. So by the way, uh, I just want to stop this, uh, this, this sound. Every, every week we tape, re videotape the entire class this is a second year college students. They have to do their lecture themselves completely in English. They've never done that in the past. So if they actually go over time or under time, I use a machine gun to shoot at them, uh, a fake one, of course. Um, uh, so, so this is the kind of thing that they use mathematic, obviously. This is the fifth week. They actually did video and, and image processing using Mathematica, and they were able to recognize the actual words in, on, on the you know, a plate. So just to quickly go through, because I don't have enough time. then. So over time, I start teaching basic mathematical courses, database concept, product development, global manufacturing strategies to international students, and also the math classes in different universities. So, so then the question is that, how can we survive in a society where grades and, and certification is so important? But how are we going to get these people to actually show what knowledge really is? For example, in data structure, in discrete math, what exactly is discrete math from a student's viewpoint? Well, let's take a look at what they did. My dad is the greatest person in the world. He can play Rubik. You see, just in a few minutes. So by the way, every team of students did something like this. I didn't ask them to do because the norm, everybody else did it. They have to do it, do it it's themselves. It's not a big deal. My daddy is a worker. He can also make it. That's engineering education in China, right there. My daddy is so good. My daddy is an artist. He can solve a Rubik in a romantic way. Hey, Benny. What about your dad? My dad is a professor, right? My can you make it? Uh, I'm not sure. Professor Dad cannot play Rubik. <laughs> no problem, Benny. I can make it. I can make it. I can make it. Morning. Good. Energetic. Okay. Rubik is one of the most challenging puzzles in the world. But with data structure and the algorithm, with modern technology, with this many obviously is not my sound. My sound is much more charming than this. It can be solved, I believe. Now, I would like a group of students do a meaningful job, make a program that can solve a Rubik. Group A, how about you guys? Any problem? Good, confident and determined. So they went on, every team made a, a video for, for program, reporting the result, they dramatized the entire class, they have out uh, down every, every other team, they actually wrote this, uh, this uh, uh, algorithm and also a computer program from scratch, and they were trying to cheat. So they, they, they downloaded some Java program, they downloaded some C program, they want to put them together, it turns out they had to actually went through a huge software engineering problem to get it to work. At the end, at the end they still got it to work. So the second year, 
a student at industrial engineering department who all hates programming. So, so I, I just want to, because time, time limitation, I, I just want to show you it actually got, you know, this is, got solved and is, is a real thing. So, so on top of that, I don't want to just do things in the digital world. I want to relate to the real world. So actually, I built this, I have students actually built this thing. So, so this is actually the physical environment. Um, this is a real helicopter uh, pilot. He happens to came, came over to give me a, a, a talk. And the other uh, 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 Netherlands guy, he's actually an engineer in uh, Philips doing the medical imaging processing. So you can see this, uh, this is a shuttleless light. We have sofa, we have 3D TV, we have a, 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 a refrigerator full, full of uh, sodas, right? So this is how I keep everybody keep working overnight. So we have many, many partners. We have UNESCO, we have CD, a global CDI initiative, we have maker spaces around the world. So, so I don't have limitation and, and shortage of, of, of good teachers. But at, at the end, how can I get these really stupid students to see math in everyday life, right? So, so I say, well, no problem. There are, there are people from Malaysia. Malaysia students are comparatively, you have to think that they're much more, on average, more stupid than you know, China, China students. But their student, in the first year, in the first semester, built this entire, uh, on, the, on the right hand side, this entire, you know, four, four quadrupter, everything, including this uh, single chip programming. So our Tsinghua University student in the Air Astro Department, third year graduate school student, couldn't, can only do a three, you know, propeller thing, right? So obviously that's much more stupid than the other people. So, so basically I said, you come to the, the school and show this to the kids, and then I want them to actually do this at Ningbo Polytechnic, where these people couldn't even get to college. So I found a, a student from Shanghai who actually designed this in one day. He can actually assemble the whole thing and, and get something to fly. So you can, bu you can buy a bunch of really, really cheap, almost scrap parts, and, and he actually managed to create a procedure. He can put, put this together within one hour, everything off the shelf or off of the, 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 the garbage, garbage place. So I have him come to my class and teach all these Nimbut Polytechnic students. Within an hour, the students actually physically assembled this and got it to fly. So after this, all these students started working very, very hard, and they started writing the blog. I require them to write, write weekly blog, and they say they completely changed the way they, how, how they see about math. And, and I, because I asked them to write weekly learning blog, and I use uh, Google Analytics to track their behavior so, that, so, so people know that everything they do is actually on the world market. So how can I really show that the Nimbo student not only can assemble this thing, but also learn the mathematical thing? So I give him Mathematica. So I give him uh, notebooks uh, produced my Tsinghua, by my Tsinghua students. So Tsinghua students did this, is, I'm sorry, the 2D example uh, using you know, so-called randomly exploring tree, a very sophisticated algorithm created by UIUC professors. And then the Nimbo student got it to work in 3D. So that shows that this is actually graduate student work. This, is, this, this kid is actually second year uh, uh, you know, polytechnic vocational school students. So, so then the, the president of the university got really uh, angry and also uh, ner nervous about this. He said, well, you got those, all these, uh, you know, secret, you know, uh, uh, how do you say, this is a national security kind of technology running in my laboratory in this vocational school, what, what am I gonna do with this, right? So put it simply, I'm, I'm trying to set up many, many toy houses around China, uh, coupled with so-called maker spaces in the, uh, the non-school area, so I can easily attract the venture capitalists and also uh, professional engineers who actually work with my students to get something done. So these are some of the labs I already set up. This one on the right-hand side is about 600 square meters. The equipment is absolutely astonishing, okay? Maker spaces around the world, probably some of you know, um, is, is places about one or 200 square meters that for people who are really good engineers to get together to create something interesting. But however, the biggest problem is it costs money and they couldn't possibly buy very expensive equipment. But schools around China, they are overinvested. They have so many empty spaces and extremely expensive materials and, and, and manufacturing equipment. They don't know how, what to do with it. So it's very easy to get them to work together. So this is, this is the Maker Carnival we just uh, did uh, just last month. So as you can see, uh, there are about a thousand people showed up, and uh, th we do this because we want to run a big one uh, next year in uh, in China again. Uh, last year, the, the the Maker Fair in San Francisco was eighty thousand people, and this year the same event in San Francisco alone was one hundred sixty thousand people. I, I don't care about the number of people in China because there are simply too much already. However, the point is that we 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 want to make sure that people. 
in China start to get the excitement of becoming very, very uh, literate in using technologies and using math and physics and, and social organization altogether. By the way, this whole event was completely organized by a bunch of students who have zero experience organizing the event. Okay. So for, for the interest of time, I'll just go, go over. Um, so, so also I get a finance student from um, uh, Zemin University, who is a, who's, who's the best, which is the best law school in China, to actually build this uh, multi-touch thing. So we're going to use this equipment to basically build up new learning spaces. So all new learning spaces will be physically built by students and designed by students from scratch. So at the end, we have all these different elements of creating a new society. So we want to have Tsinghua University, the best uh, uh, technology university in China, the best art school in China. We'll be setting up a toy house very soon uh, this year. And we also have Creative Commons uh, organization, which is run in Renmin University, the best law school in China. So we want to have all the best schools in China start leading all the other schools. We have about 3,000 schools to basically pr provide the physical infrastructure, the law, the market, and the norm to change the culture of China. And hopefully we can change the world afterwards. So put, put it simply. A new knowledge supply chain is emerging. Brand new infrastructure is already there, but the key point is that we, get, we have to get a student to do it, and we've proven that students can do it very easily. So the last thing is that, welcome to Toy House. Thank you. <laughs>